The many outstanding qualities of Kevin Blank, our visual effects supervisor. One of them is uh, spontaneity and the ability to think on his feet. We came up with a shot here today of this uh, blue screen shot that would allow us to composite our characters uh, climbing the mountain into that rock face way over there. And uh, so we're, we're doing it, even though, you know, typically you'd want to spend a lot of time planning this and prepping it. We just thought, that's cool, and we're doing it. And that's like, that's what this crew is. It's uh, nutty and, uh, and incredibly uh, talented. When we were shooting the pilot, my, my part of it only took place here. And, and, you know, I got to meet, finally, the rest of the cast. And we were all there together. And we got here and saw the plane on the beach. And it was, it was just, you know, like, oh my god, like, uh, this is astounding. Oh, uh, this is really real. <laughs> Guys, today we are going to learn how to run in the sand in stilettos. Which, these are very special stilettos. These could kill a man. Stop! I'm a lifeguard. I'm licensed. We had five days to shoot the opening sequence uh, on the beach. My God! The plane, though it was it crashed, was sort of a dying monster, but it was still very much alive. I had never seen such an elaborate set. It was easy to transport myself to actually being in that situation. I was awestruck by it. The thing was choreographed so that if you were looking down at the plane, you sort of tracked along each side of the plane until you made a full circle by the time the wind crashed. It's a real plane that they've made to look like this. Everything was real. Every explosion happened. On the bottom right-hand corner, I'm the guy that gets thrown back. The wing, when that dropped, it dropped. We had one go at that. Move! Get her up! Get her out of there! The wing! You know, there's engines on fire and, and people screaming and there's smoke everywhere and stuff falling and so much stuff happening. You really got to be on your game. Okay, good. Cut. From the beginning, J.J. wanted the, the, the show to look very real, very cinematic. And that's a challenge in some ways, because sometimes it's harder to make something look real and unlit and, you know, almost documentary. We came up with this idea that there would be someone who was trapped by a piece of the landing gear and allowed Jack to sort of be a hero and, and come and sort of save the guy. But it set up a few characters, you know, in a situation near the engine. You sort of think it's just about Jack being the hero, but what it really is about is setting up this giant engine. And as soon as you see the engine going, you sort of know that someone's going to get sucked in. We are going to test our rig for camera before camera and everybody watches it. And uh, we rehearsed this the other day, and now we're going to just test it, make sure everything's still ready to go, because sometimes it changes day to day. And uh, he's going to run into the shot. And in the script, somebody's yelling to him to stop, and he stops right in front of the engine, and the engine spools up and sucks him in. This is the jet engine that I'm going to get sucked into today. And basically what we have here is a ratchet system. I got a harness on underneath here, and uh, you kind of see it here. And uh, it just hooked me up in the middle of my back, and through there, over there, Dane and Jake are running the system. Everything should be fine. We'll actually remove this entire piece right here and rebuild this engine entirely in CG and blow that up. When the guy got sucked into the engine and stuff like that, that, that was pretty wild. I was pretty amazed that we were doing a television show and that that stuff was being involved in it. But at the time, I didn't know Locke's story. I didn't know then that I had been confined to a wheelchair. So they were holding everything pretty close to the vest. So when I ran over and helped, I wasn't aware that a moment ago I had been a paraplegic. One of the things that, that I, I wanted to do was not have it be gruesome. You know, I wanted to have it be scary and uh, shocking, but I didn't want people to, to get disgusted by it. So I wanted there to be no red at all. 
so that the plane never had, had any red on the logo, no one wore any red clothes, because once it became a bloody mess, which, you know, was something that is probably more realistic, once it, was, it looked like a massacre, it just, to me, would just be untenable and people would, would tune out. So I wanted it to be uh, shocking when you saw blood, so that when the guy gets pulled out from under the landing gear and you see the blood in his leg, you have a reaction to that blood. If we had been, re been realistic and sort of had as much blood everywhere as there probably would have been, seeing that blood on his leg would have had no effect. The opening's 22-minute first act of that, that crash sequence, the way that I work as an editor is I try to work empathetically. I try to place myself in the position of the character and then like imagine what the character's feeling and then try to work from that. So like how do I best communicate what this character is emotionally experiencing? The footage from that crash was so harrowing. It used to bring me to tears sometimes when I was working on it. It felt so intense. I mean, when it came in, we were just blown away. I mean, we were also proud of it because, you know, to do a pilot like that and, and be the studio that was involved in that and the network, it was just like, look at this piece of work. I mean, it's just a devastating movie. It felt like a film. You know, I've kind of been immersed in the film industry for so long that I got confused and, and thought that we were making a film and, and the cinematic kind of scope of it, you know, I thought at some point ABC were probably going to say, let's try and release this at the cinema and, and turn it into a feature film. It was that grand in its scale and, and that ambitious. I mean, my big point to him was like, I think there's got to be some element that is comfortable, something that represents home to these people, but surrounded completely by this very esoteric, weird, strange, uncomfortable sound. And I was trying to think of what instruments can we use, because we do this live, and there's live orchestra, and I wanted to kind of set up a very different sound for this show. I just didn't want it to be, okay, I'm scoring another show, and it's gonna have that sound to it. I wanted it to be really different. So I started thinking about, okay, what's our ensemble gonna be? And the strings, we knew we wanted a string section, because strings you can, are very really versatile you, in that you can make people feel really like, it can be tender, it can be beautiful, or they can be just horrifying and scary. So those are great tools to have. Uh, that what do we surround that with? And we thought, okay, um, how about just bizarre percussion, you know? And the first thought was like, okay, they're on in a, in a jungle, so jungle. But it was like, no, we don't want jungle percussion. We want stuff that's like bizarre. So what we did was we shipped home sections of the airplane. While shooting, JJ had specifically said we should save some pieces of the plane and bring it back so Michael can use it for scoring. At the tail end of production, I kind of went through the wreckage and uh, picked out some good pieces as far as wreckage goes. We shipped it up in a big crate, and when we got back to the scoring stage, Michael strung it up and used it for a lot of the percussion. We used that on the show, uh, and in the percussion booth, the guy plays the airplane pieces. We have an instrument called the anklong, which is normally a wooden instrument, but we have one that uh, is made of metal. So we're using that, that has a very unique sound to it. Um, we're using a piano board that was ripped out of a piano. Uh, so it's just basically the guts of a piano and just banging on all kinds of weird, just different things. And the idea is to use these kind of conventional instruments in ways that you don't normally use these instruments. Look for the cockpit. See if we can find a transceiver. Yeah, this is genius. Going into the jungle after that sound last night. The thing to move those trees. The monster thing was dealt with with a lot of sophistication. It wasn't this kind of, you know, boogeyman. It, it was something that was genuinely scary. Emily? Did anybody see that? Yeah. Unfortunately. When Damon and I came up with this show, the reason we ended the first act with the monster is we just wanted to say, like, up front, this is the kind of show it is. We really needed that external force that was so overwhelming and so um, seemingly unbeatable for our characters that they could come together 
in the face of it, that it, would, that it was a challenge and, and a threat that would force them to, to bond where they wouldn't have bonded otherwise.